<laughs> Hello. Hello. Welcome to week 11 of Hot Pot Talk season two. We have arrived at our penultimate episode. My name is Jen Sunshine here with my dear friend and longtime creative partner, David Ng. We are the co-artistic directors of Love Intersections, a media arts collective that produces documentary films about QT BIPOCs. We're also members of the Vancouver Artists Labor Union Cooperative, also known as Value Co-op. Before we begin, we want to acknowledge that David and I are beaming this episode of Hapa Talks from the unceded and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Part of our work as labor activists and queer artists on unceded territories means working in solidarity with ongoing indigenous struggles for sovereignty, decolonization, reparations, and land back. We want to highlight the land defenders at Ferry Creek who were just raided by the RCMP in light of recent events. A fundraising link is being dropped into the chat now. Please donate if you can. You should know this by now, Hot Pot Talks is a weekly series live streaming to YouTube and Facebook every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Pacific time, where we have free flowing conversations with artists, activists, chefs, performers, poets, community organizers about what it means to be an artist facing today's realities. What ethical responsibilities do we have as artists? This season, we continue these conversations on topics ranging from anti-Asian racism, BIPOC futurity, Chinatown solidarity, diasporic food culture, and interrogating the boundaries between everyday activism, fine art, and cultural work. Uh, we founded Love Intersections on the philosophy of collaboration, invitation, and relationship building with and within communities to tell intergenerational and intersectional stories. And, and, a, car part, and a core part of our work as social practice artists has been to interrogate the boundaries between art, philosophy, community work, and activism. Um, when the pandemic put a pause on our creative and community work, uh, we uh, created Hot Pot Talks as a joyous way to continue this dialogue on art and cultural production with people that we are inspired by. Um, before we introduce our guest today, I want to thank our incredible team, Cameron, who is our project lead project coordinator, and Lamia, our social media coordinator, who helped make Hot Pot Talks a reality. Uh, so without further ado, we are so thrilled to invite Dr. Dylan Rodriguez, who is a teacher, scholar, and activist. He was named to the inaugural Class of Freedom Scholars in 2020 and is past president of the American Studies Association. Um, he has worked as professor at the University of California, Riverside uh, since 2001. Dylan is the author of three books, most recently White Reconstruction, Domestic Warfare, and The Logic of Racial Genocide. He is a founding member of the Critical Ethnic Studies Association and Critical Resistance, a leading carceral abolitionist organization, and he is a part of the Abolition Collective and Scholars for Social Justice and continuously works in and alongside various radical movements and collectives. Welcome, Dylan. What's up? Hello. Hey, Dylan. <laughs> How's it going? Here we are. <laughs> Welcome to the hot pot table. Thank you for inviting me. This, this, yeah. thing is a, this thing's like a, a little online fucking party. And like, <laughs> so I just I just tweeted it out like a few minutes ago. So I think oh, amazing. You know, oh, some friends and loved ones might might be uh, might be curious and jump in for a minute to see what we're doing. I appreciate being sweet. invited. Yeah, where where and maybe you can share with us with our audience. Where are you? Absolutely. From? Absolutely. Um, so I. I I, I was uh, grew up in Northern Virginia, so I want to make that really clear. Um, there's a difference uh, that I have detected ever since I've lived in California between Filipinos that were that, that grew up on the East Coast and then Filipinos who grew up in California. And right. most California, most California-based uh, uh, Filipino Americans know that. Like they try to figure that shit out like pretty quickly. And they're mm -hmm. like, "Where are you from?" Because mm -hmm. they know I'm just not from here. Um, but I'm talking to you today from uh, occupied Tongva Kawia land, uh, which is uh, Southern California. I'm in Riverside County, city of Corona, actually the unincorporated part of Corona. And um, I, as you said, I, I work at a university where um, just down the street, the Riverside Police Department stole the life of Taisha Miller uh, shortly mm -hmm. before I joined the faculty. So I always try to honor that because it's a kind mm -hmm. of landmark moment in um, the, uh, the kind of history and, and formation mm -hmm. of, of this place. Right, yeah. um, among, among many others, but yeah, Taisha Miller's um, the killing of Taisha Miller by Riverside Police Department's major. So that's that's how I mark where I work. You know what I mean, and where I, mm -hmm. where I live now. 
Mm -hmm. Well, we're so excited to go deep in conversation with you, but also to laugh. So <laughs> I feel like we should start with kind of like a fun question that I like to ask guests, um, which is how would you describe yourself outside of your profession or work? And if you want to make it kind of juicier, what is something <laughs> that people often misunderstand about you? I don't know. Okay. I think the thing that gets misunderstood is that my outbursts of rage are coming mm. from a pretty well thought out place almost mm. all the time. Mm -hmm. All right. So like I have, I have, um, I went to anger management for a year, right? Like I shoot, like I, that's one of my constituting characteristics is, is, is really rage. Right. At the same time, I love to laugh. I'm, I think I'm the funniest person probably in the vicinity <laughs> all the time. Like nobody ever, you know, my, my, my immediate family's really tired of my sense of humor. Other people are, you a, are you a Leo? <laughs> no, I'm a, I'm a Libra. Okay. Just curious. Cause it sounds I'm like, it sounds the, like me. I'm not part of the whole, like, you know, whole, you know, the whole horoscope cult or anything, but like I'm a Libra. And most people say that I come off like one because, because, you know, I'll judge the fuck out of you when it's time to do that. <laughs> right. Even though my <laughs> principle is not to do that. Um, mm -hmm. But part listen, that, you know, it, part of being a Libra too is about a kind of aesthetic um, awareness and understanding of your environment, much like Taurus, myself, uh, and, and Leo, which is David. So, I so think you're saying, so, so say you and me are like this and David's just down, that's why David's down there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yes, precisely. Because when you were, when we were just in the back room um, about, you know, 10 minutes ago, you were asking if you should take away the spray bottle that was right. in the background. So I feel like that's like, that's a very Libra thing to do. Oh, so that, that's just because I've been scolded. I've been scolded <laughs> by people. They're like, man, the next, Different people around me, like the next time you go on any of these things and you leave the bed undone or you leave some random right. Febreze bottle in the back, I will never forgive you. I'm like, oh my God, okay, okay, yeah, you're right, you're right. I gotta keep in mind. No, but but yeah. just to answer your question, yeah, I think I think um I think I think people mistake mistake uh my emoting and my expressions of my feelings yeah. as being somehow not thought out and somehow not also part of what I'm rigorously thinking and doing all the time, right? Like mm -hmm. the, the the anger that I express, um, especially post anger management, like I'm better about about kind of like finding ways to express myself that control my rage a little bit more and like filter it a little bit, but also direct it in appropriate ways. Mm -hmm. um, because the first thing the first thing that that got demystified is that like you know anger is actually a very healthy thing, right? Rage is a very healthy thing. Yeah. Um, it's just like any other emotion. Like you can't be addicted to love. You can't be addicted to anger either. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean, like you can't, it's like none of that. So, so I think that gets misunderstood a lot because um, in part, because maybe because of the professional circles I'm in where there's such a respectability obsession. Right. Um, yeah. with, even, 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 and especially a lot of us who claim the critique of respectability, like right. we find ourselves falling into performing respectability way too much. 100%. Right. And, and so like, it's, it it like it just it just numbs and saps your soul. So, um, I'm too, I'm, I feel like I'm getting too old for that now. You know what I mean? Yeah. So so yeah. that's why, um, in most settings, unless I'm I'm asked not to, in most settings, I try to cuss at least four or five times, <laughs> right? Because well, because it's just yeah. part of how I talk and how I think. It's like I'm a profane person mm -hmm. in some ways. You know what I mm -hmm. mean? And like some shit around me is so fucking profane that I'm gonna call it what it is and express it the way it needs to be expressed. But again, like. Yeah. That's such a brilliant question, but it's like it, it forces me to understand like this is actually part of what I think folks around me at times don't understand. But the people who know me well do know. Mm -hmm. Right. Like it, they figure that out well. It's part of being part of our in affinity and intimacy with each other. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the the social the, the perception of you as like a man of color, too. I'm sure there's all yeah. there's the, that stuff there, too. Right. Entangled. Yeah. 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 Um, one of the first things that happened to me when I um, joined the faculty here at UC Riverside was. Uh, I, I was supporting I was supporting a demonstration that was led by undergraduate uh, women of color, um, mm -hmm. yeah. brown women. A lot of them, if not most of them, actually, uh, from um, you know from 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 a, some called Chicano student programs from Mecha. It was like mm -hmm. at that point, Mecha was a really radical abolitionist, feminist, and and, mm -hmm. and, and pro queer, queer liberationist formation of students. And anyway, I was at that demonstration, and some shit went down. Um, and I got called out in the UC, UCR police department um, incident report as an irate Hispanic. So yes, oh, yes, yeah. Jen, 
Yes, Jim. What? Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. yeah. P- people who were around me at that time, including my significant other, still joke about it, right? Like, wow. say, just don't be an irate Hispanic when you Man. go to this, this, or that thing. So, like, try not to be the irate wow. Hispanic, at least not right away. Wow. You know, I resonate so much with what you said around like the the, the productiveness of rage because I am a facilitator by trade. So, one of the things that I run towards, as opposed to running away from, is co- the word conflict, mm-hmm. and that I actually think like conflict in the context of like organizing group work when you gather together it's actually Mm. it's what moves things it's 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 what it's what moves right Right. um yeah i never run away from conflict um unless it's with my partner sitting with discomfort too right yeah that's where like you shift right if you're yeah you would hope so you would hope so but but part of you know i think there's there's a, a kind of thread that runs across the spectrum of political positions and organizing, mm. especially for those who see themselves as as on the side of transformation or abolition or revolution, et cetera, mm. um, in which discomfort gets conflated with a lack of commitment to the movement. It gets conflated with disunity mm. and undermining whatever it is that the organizing or the community formation is, is striving toward. Uh, yeah. so, there, so there's a way that that the, that the discomfort and for that matter conflict in particular mm-hmm. just just are actively edged out of everyday political practice mm-hmm. you know um uh and and i think it's I, frankly i think it's incredibly damaging because part of what you see with folks in the conservative and reactionary uh, you know elements is is they get engaged in intense contention with each other all the time and they don't always agree on shit yeah right they'll have severe differences both of like perspective of tactic of strategy of ideology of agenda of everything and yet and yet and yet even despite their refusal to kind of see themselves as one unified block um they fuck the world up and make life miserable Mm-hmm. and wage mm-hmm. such effective forms of warfare against mm-hmm. everybody else on the fucking planet, like yeah. all the time, all the time. And it's because they proliferate their capacity and their will to inflict pain, mm-hmm. right? To inflict, you know, to inflict violence, like oppressive violence, mm-hmm. right? Because I'm not, I'm not against violence, but I'm against oppressive violence. Yeah. Right? yeah. yeah. So, so they have, so that's why that side tends to do their work in such an effective way because it's like it's so it's so much about misery and destruction and and mm. and, 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 and conquest and occupation all the rest and then and the folks that are trying to resist that you know buy into this notion that in order to be effective in oh shit, shit maybe even just to survive the onslaught that there, that there has to be this thing that we that we presume to be necessary which is unity right hmm. right like, like which is really uniformity Mm-hmm. You know, because you can mm-hmm. you can have moments of unity among people who have principal disagreements on really important things, but you can right. have like moments of tactical and strategic unity. So, but that's a whole different thing. It's it's more what you're talking about, Jen, which is like you know, in in, in organizing collectives, there's a notion that you have to get to the next agenda objective. You've got mm-hmm. to get right. to the next outcome. You've got to get to the next meeting. So we don't have time. We don't have time, and we don't have energy to wade through these debates that you want us to get engaged with. And frankly. That's what destroys and undermines, or actually I shouldn't say that. It doesn't necessarily destroy and, under, and destroy and undermine movements. What it does is it makes movements liberal. Right. Yes. Right. It right. makes uh, yes. movements that are otherwise potent, radical, potentially radical, abolitionist, potentially radical, you know, potentially abolitionist, liberationist, potentially liberationist. It, it undermines the ability to kind of form the, the, the complex and layered politics and, and, and you know, mutual engagement and, and, and fleshing out of difference and antagonism that is necessary mm-hmm. right. to be part of a movement. Like if you look at the historical uh, context of movements that you would name in those ways, they were really deeply complex. There was lots of contradictions and debates and arguments. There was interpersonal beef. There was political yeah. beef. But, but, but the reason that those movements were so dangerous to the existing oppressive order was precisely because the movement was fueled, um, it, it, the movements continued not only in spite of those things, but in some ways they were animated by them. Yeah. Right, right? that the difference, like you look, at, you look at the most radical phases of the black liberation movement in this hemisphere during the, uh, the latter 60s into the early 70s, there are rife contradictions. I mean, it was being infiltrated by the, by the FBI and, 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 and police departments that were actually exacerbating some of those antagonisms. And yet mm-hmm. 
what's profound and somewhat in, in you know from the outside looking in seems miraculous right mm. is is that is that is that the movement's permanently shifted political culture made a permanent contribution to the archive of black revolutionary and black radical movement mm. because they were animated by those antagonisms and differences right um and and, and, and in hindsight you like figure that shit out you learn from it and now we even have you know films on netflix coming out talking about black judas and the messiah right and like now yes. and not only that but we have a yeah. critique of how of how that film represents all that shit. So right. um anyway, yeah. Dylan, I wanted to ask you how did you get, get be, how did you get into the abolition movement? What was your journey? I was invited. That? I was invited. Mm. That's that's the short answer. And and I think mm. that is to me the most robust the one not not the most one of the most robust characteristics of mm. the long archive, the long tradition, long genealogy of, of black radicals and black abolitionist uh, politics and black liberation struggle. Mm -hmm. is is its is its willingness to invite people like me people like you mm -hmm. into into the struggle in 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 whatever way you can contribute mm -hmm. um so this is to say that at the time i was invited the, the the movement was not explicitly calling itself abolitionist at the point man you just took a drink i'm gonna take a drink <laughs> please do cheers <laughs> um it didn't see itself necessarily as abolitionist yet but mm -hmm. it did see itself as a movement against what was then being called the prison industrial complex. This is the mid 1990s right. into yeah. the 1997, 1998. So it wasn't naming itself abolitionist yet, right? But it, but it was clearly on its way there. And the reason why I say that is because when I was in the room with folks that were doing this work, and these were veteran folks, I was nobody. I was just invited in. I, it was a very humbling experience. Um, I shut my fucking mouth and listened yeah. almost all the time. I'd maybe ask a question here and there, but mostly I was trying to bond with some of these people around me who um, had been involved in this struggle for, for some of them for decades, right? Some of them surviving political incarceration, social incarceration, some targeted by the FBI's um, 10 most wanted list, on and on and on. So I was learning from these folks and, and the movement did not necessarily see itself yet as abolitionists. It clearly had roots in the black radical tradition, but it was also thinking about the broadest possible base of opposition to the prison industrial complex. So there was a Puerto Rican independence movement component. Mm -hmm. There was a, 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 a radical proto-abolitionist um, LGBTQ queer dimension. Mm -hmm. There were sectarian organizations, like left sectarian organizations were hopping on this thing. They were like, what does it mean to be, you know, part of the Revolutionary Communist Party or whatever? Mm -hmm. um, and to be, you know, to be undertaking struggle against the against the uh, uh, the PIC. Um, but but it was it was nothing more or less than an invitation. It was actually my teacher Angela Davis who called me one day and left a message on my on my voicemail. Um, this is back in the day um, for the young folks out there. This is back in the day when we Name actually had that. we actually had. Well, I don't mean to do that, but I mean she's, <laughs> no, my, teacher, she's my teacher. Brilliant. Angela's my teacher, and yeah. and um, yeah, I'll, I'll always have a debt of gratitude for the way she's been patient with mm -hmm. me over the years and the way she's like pushed me and challenged me. But but it was this back in the day when we actually had like physical answering machines, and there was like a tape in them. Yeah. So, so like you can probably find them on eBay, like like a like a like an artifact, you know what I mean? Yeah. But yeah. I just came home one day to my one bedroom in Oakland and played the thing back and 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 um you know my, my teacher Angela Davis was like, Hey, we're having this meeting in my house next week. I'd like you to come. We're doing this, we're trying to form this group to do this organizing. And really what they needed was like they needed I I feel like they needed me less for any kind of intellectual energy I brought, although I'm sure they wanted that. Um, but they needed me just to be a you know, in the best sense of the term, a worker. Mm. Right. Yeah. And like and like they knew I was ready to contribute that. So that's what I was. Maybe. Right. The first I'd say five years that I maybe maybe four or five years that I worked with critical resistance, I was primarily just contributing whatever form of labor I possibly could to make myself useful to the room. So mm -hmm. so that's the invitation. I try to be the same way as a teacher, as an organizer, a scholar, a writer, a thinker, activist, in a conversation, you know, a conversation partner with people to say that like this is abolitionist you know, struggle is not some kind of litmus test or hazing that you pass. No, man, this is a community. It's a global community. It's a dynamic community. Yeah. Uh, and it's just being wedded to the principle that you want to to, to, to basically cease oppression now. Yeah. That you, you know what I mean? That you want to stop anti-black state violence and policing now. You, you know what yeah. I mean? You want to end the colonial, the, the outcomes of colonial occupation and the police state in apartheid sites all around the world now. Like there's no, there's no compromising of that. There's no tweaking and reforming of that. It has to stop. Yeah. Um, that's all it means. And it's an mm. invitation. Mm. That's how it starts. 
I want to also ask you about the because I, you know, I, I, when I read your article uh, toward uh, the Asian exception and the scramble for legibility, it really it changed the way that I knew about learned about um, abolition. I I was joking with Jen. It's a it's a degree that I'm not very proud of. <laughs> in my my undergrad in my undergrad, one of my majors was criminology, and I actually learned abolition through. Criminology. I was hey, taking a look. It. David, you just have to weaponize it. Don't be ashamed. Be proud. <laughs> like, I weaponize this shit. Like, I know yeah. what you do. Yeah. And I tell you, it was very, this is why it, I turned to women's studies because I was right taking, on. you know, it was, it was, I was taking classes with people who wanted to be cops. And it was just, mm -hmm. anyway, that's a whole. And yeah. And when, it, you know, I, it, it, your article really sort of, I, you know, at the end of last season of Hot Pop Talks, I was really struggling with how do we talk about anti-Asian racism and also talk about solidarity with Black and Indigenous yeah. communities. And your article really sort of summed up for me and made clear for me sort of, um, as you described, the ethical obligations to abolition. But I'm curious, like, what compelled you? And because, you know, we're, we're in different contexts. We're in Vancouver. You're sure. in Southern California. What was the context um, that you were responding to? Um, and how did that, yeah, why did you write, you know, why did you write that article, I guess? So, so first off, shout out, shout out to my friend and colleague and co-conspirator, Charmaine Chua, who's a professor at UC Santa Barbara, who is badass and you need to have on the show because um, yeah. she's smart yeah. as fuck. Like she's really cool and she's the most abolitionist abolitionist I know. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. she's she's actually the one that got this thing going and trying mm -hmm. to pull together people that she knew were 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 had histories doing abolitionist work to respond to. It, it was less a response to the actual anti Asian violence. It's more a response to this kind of you know kind of surge. Of liberal progressive Hollywood yeah. influencer nonprofit industrial complex um, people and organizations that were that were um, funneling this hashtag stop Asian hate thing into a particular type of not only a political agenda but yeah. also a way of understanding anti Asian violence um, and anti Asian yeah. racism for that matter mm -hmm. that was that was uh, completely undermining to the work that we were that we were doing we continue to do so so i came into the article number one at the invitation of, of well more at the prodding of my friend charmaine um but it was also because you know charmaine and uh, charmaine and i and the other folks who wrote that wrote in that series um uh mm -hmm. of, of articles we were all involved and we remain involved in the cops off campus organizing yeah right mm -hmm. so we're we were part of the california um the california statewide group that was doing cops off campus work in the university of california system uh for folks out there that are watching listening you know it, it, the campaign the point of the campaign is to uh abolish police presence at university and college yeah. campuses of every kind from junior college all the way to you know ivy league universities and everything in between mm -hmm. in the yeah. kind of hierarchy of universities and colleges um so you know we're, we're it's abolitionist work right mm -hmm. it's abolitionist work and the point of it is to exemplify how if you can if you can eliminate police presence in in a contained you know geography like a university and college then you can do it other places as well um and there'll yeah. probably be a domino effect so so that mm -hmm. was that was the main context for doing the work and then and then kind of the larger context and i would say you know i'm in southern california you're in vancouver we're in the same fucking hemisphere right mm -hmm. we're in the same colonial anti-black yeah. hemisphere mm -hmm. so in some ways our yeah. context is very much connected even though there's specificities we got to pay attention to um, yes. Yeah. But 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 the other part of this was 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 responding to the sense of exceptionalism that that I saw permeating um, uh, some of these liberal and progressive responses, particularly mm -hmm. to the fatal violence in Atlanta, the Atlanta area. Yeah. Right. right. Um, it, it was a kind of notion of trying to distinguish and singularize, or maybe even kind of uh, in, in, in a conceptual political sense, isolate mm -hmm. anti-Asian violence right. in a way that I saw completely defeating. Um, the possibilities of understanding what was what had just happened in the Atlanta area as uh, uh, inseparable, interconnected, and generally symbiotic. Number one, with the surge of of, of armed um, state and extra state white nationalist reaction that's been ongoing for multiple decades. It didn't just fucking happen since two, 2016 in November, right? Yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so number one was part of that. But but number two, an opportunity to think about how how this particular form of suffering um, can bring a kind of politics of, of, of you know the API left into closer affinity and intimacy with other groups that 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 experience this kind of reactionary violence every fucking day all the time and it's not isolated to particular incidents 
of atrocity, right? It's like to say, you know, let, what would it mean to just deprovincialize yeah. what just happened here, mm -hmm. right? What would it mean to think about it not merely as anti-Asian, but also as part of a totality of warfare mm. against targeted populations of which of which Asian people, right? Asian, Asian, and sometimes Pacific Island, yeah, often Pacific Island people, probably more yeah. fundamentally Pacific Island people, are fundamentally part of it, but maybe in a different kind of way, with different vulnerability, with different exposure. That's yeah. what we need to actually do. Right? Yeah. And, and if anything, this was an opportunity to generate the kind of abolitionist um I, I think I say at the very least solidarity. At the very least, it's solidarity. But but more but more the possibility of bringing people from these political communities into the actual ongoing work of of, of abolitionist struggle, mm. which doesn't necessarily see itself as coalitional or solid. It's like it's just what you do, right? Mm -hmm. It's a method. It's a method of doing things. So it's like this is an opportunity to bring people into that. And instead, what 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 I saw some folks doing, like they're they're talking about. Hate crimes. Hate crimes. Like, yeah. you know, there's a, yeah. Let's push the FBI and the cops in DAs to prosecute this as a hate crime. The turn was yeah. right away to the criminalizing arm of the state, as if that's going to solve the problem. That's not going to do yeah. shit. Like you might, you yeah. might prosecute one person. That's not going to solve and stop anti-Asian violence. It's not going to yeah. solve and stop white nationalist reaction. Um, what you actually need to do is build, build movement and, and right. build abolitionist struggle against against this form of violence. And so. Um, so it's really that, and, and and I feel like you know have an opportunity to talk about it with, with with folks like you that are doing the work up there and doing work in different spheres. I mean that's really critical because um, we got to fight this this kind of tendency of of nonprofits and Hollywood type folks to try to monopolize the discourse and turn it into the only thing that circulates into the popular and common you know consciousness because it's, it's attractive to people, right? The hashtag yeah. is attractive yeah. to people, and then you know and it reduces it to hate, and it's like hate has yeah. only this much to do with it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. A lot of this shit is very calculated and, and, and hate is a, is, is a minor part of it. Like this is actually yeah. about a sense of, of, of violent, you know, colonial and racial entitlement, which is the, in, in some ways it's, it's, it's not in the same dimension as hate. This is something yeah. deeper than hate. Well, hate, and I think you touch on this in the article too. I mean, hate um, it, it sort of reduces it to this type of like, oh, it comes from nowhere, right? It, 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 it dilutes the systemic parts of of how that how what you're just describing of, of racism right yeah 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 and, and it's and this is this is what a kind of liberal perspective does right is that is that it'll view repressive oppressive atrocious violence yeah as being something that is somehow irrational yeah and and outside what the normal operation of society in the state are and should be Okay, and that's the other problem with this, right? And you just put your finger on it, David. Is like mm -hmm. part part of this was the kind of narrative mm -hmm. around anti Asian violence was to identify it as number one as being exceptional and profoundly different, right? Mm -hmm. Something outside what is normal, right? Asian people not supposed to suffer this kind of violence, right? So mm -hmm. there's a there's a deep kind of colonial coloniality and anti blackness that runs through this, yeah. Yeah. right? Because it's yeah. a sense of like the entitlement yeah. that no Asians aren't supposed to aren't supposed to suffer this way. That's what get targeted this way, like right. yeah. up. You know, this is why um, I'll leave names out of it. But you had people going on their social media putting bounties on, right, on on specific perpetrators of you know of like closed circuit camera recorded um, violence against Asian elders, right? They're putting a twenty thousand dollar bounty if you catch this guy, right? And they're almost right. always black, by the way. Right, mm -hmm. there's a certain right. narrative going out there that it was like it was it was it was it was black men, black boys, and black men that were somehow the primary perpetrators of anti, which is of course bullshit. If y'all don't know that, look it up. Like it's yeah. bullshit. This is a kind yeah. of a cherry pick narrative and cherry pick set of images that are put out there. Um, um, but but yeah, I mean this is this is part of what was was and remains so damaging mm -hmm. about, about how these these kind of moments of violence get seized on to to concentrate, isolate, and separate a particular response. So that again, it becomes a liberal response, right? You look to the state to kind of fix your problem, not uh, uh, not understanding how the violence and atrocity that that you and your loved ones and your people just experience is is interconnected with normalized atrocity that is happening all the fucking time, yes. right? And and it's a profoundly chauvinistic and um, frankly, you know, violently privileged to not mm -hmm. think about it that way, mm -hmm. right? What would it mean to think about? What would it mean to think about? these forms of militarized anti-Asian violence as part of the normalized anti-blackness of the police, right? That's mm. the kind of thinking and analysis and movement that, that I think, you know, the abolitionist folks that I know 
within and beyond the, the, the Asian American, um, you know, Asian North American community, like way beyond that. That's how that's how folks think about it. It's like this is part of what's happening in Ferguson. It's part of what's happening in Oakland. Yeah. Part of what happens. It's like that's what this is actually part of. It is inseparable mm -hmm. from that. In that sense, it is not merely reducible to anti-Asian racism. Right. Right. Well said. Yeah. I've been, you know, I, I, I've been thinking about this a lot because I think like I, I compare some of the, and maybe it's just also just the bubble that I'm in as well. But I find that like in, in Western Canada, we pride ourselves as having this alleged rep reputation of being more, more progressive or whatnot. Yeah. And <laughs> so, yeah. And, and it's just not true. Like, you know, and I, I, I look at the, the conversations around abolition, for example, it, it, it back East, like in Toronto, especially where there is more much more vibrant conversations about it than it is um over here where you know they hate the defunding the police um mm. legislation wasn't i don't think it, it passed at all mm. also we have we have we have um city councillors who who are married to cops so maybe that's probably right. mm -hmm. part of the issue too but, hey look man city yeah. councillors in many if not most instances actually basically are cops right <laughs> so let's be real yeah yeah <laughs> um should we, Jen, um, should we pivot to a lighter question? No, you want to ask a fun question? That was a light question. <laughs> that, was... I mean, that was a light and fun question. All right, can... <laughs> um, oh, well, actually, I do want to know this story because you, in our pre-interview, you oh, had yes. talked about your biggest Bay Area regret. And you had kind of saved it for this, for this, for the live stream. Can you tell oh, us your biggest Bay Area? Bay Area did, I, did I give you a hint? It was yes. It was it was you. Oh, it was. You gotta help me. I have was, so many regrets this, in my was life. This, was this an athlete the... that you had? Oh yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. <laughs> my biggest Bay Area regret. Okay. Uh, first of all, I'm one of these people. Like, I'm not one of these people who says, "Oh, I've no. I live my life with no regrets." I have so many <laughs> fucking regrets in my life. I fucked up so much in my oh. life. There's so much shit I wish I had done and. A few things I wish I had not done or maybe done differently. Um, so I have tons of regrets. So it's a big deal. This is my biggest Bay Area regret. So this is this is the context is that I went to graduate school in the Bay Area. I did my PhD in ethnic studies at, uh, uh, at UC Berkeley from 1995 to 2001. But my regret does not come from that period. It comes from uh, a period. When was it? It was 2016 when I went to um, I, I had just been elected the uh, chair of our academic senate at University of California, Riverside. Right. Mm -hmm. So we go to these monthly meetings in downtown Oakland. Um, in this horrible place called the UC Office of the President, UCOP. I shit you not. It is called UCOP, right? And that is very much what the experience is. It's this horrible building on Franklin Street. Anyway, so I snuck out of the meeting in the middle of the day and went one block away to Marshawn Lynch's boutique shop called Beast Mode, right? He's got this boutique line of clothing and caps and sweatshirts, and it's, it's, it's really cool. And I love Marshawn Lynch. I just love his way of being in the world, right? I love the way he plays the game. I love the way he is in, exists in the world. I love his uh, response to um, the mm -hmm. kind of compulsory corporate demands on him when he was, when he was, you know, playing with the Seattle Seahawks and his refusal to cooperate. Um, he's my daughter's at the, you know, he was, he was my daughter's favorite athlete for a long time, not because she has anything to do with, with, you know, American football, but mm -hmm. more because she saw the press conference at the Super Bowl that I made her watch, where every <laughs> every response that Marshawn Lynch had was either yeah for one session and the other session was I'm just here so I don't get fined, right? So I'm like, <laughs> that is how you do it, right uh... there, unapologetic. Anyway, I went to the Beast Mode shop and who was chilling outside on his mountain bike but Marshawn Lynch and he was holding court, he was talking to a group of people and I was like, oh shit, he must hang out here all the time, right? So like, okay, cool, I bought my sweatshirt and I thought about I thought about saying what's up to him and trying to do like FaceTime with him and mm -hmm. get my daughter on the phone so that she would finally like have some respect for me as a person and as a parent <laughs> by like saying, hey, look who I'm with and like doing a little selfie with Marshawn Lynch like that. Yeah. But I was like, I left him alone because he was talking to somebody. I was like, now nah, I'll leave him alone. I'll come back next time because I was, you know, at that point I was going to be up there every month for these meetings. I, and I'm so sad to say that since that time. Four years of those meetings, right? I never saw him again. So, Marshawn, if you are wow. out there, hit me up, <laughs> DM me on Instagram or Twitter, and like, can we please do like a Zoom or something like that for for one minute, just so that we can record something that my daughter will think I'm cool. <laughs> that's my biggest. That, that's my biggest bare area regret. Amazing. Thank that's you amazing. for sharing that. Um, so, speaking of your daughter, I I am per just by just fascinated by intergenerational conversations. Mm. Um, I don't know how, that we have conversations, Jen. 
Well, <laughs> I think you can, I'm, but I want to know what kind of conversations you have because like, I think um, what I'm fascinated by is how each generation fights its battles and so to speak. Oh, and so, I'm, that's, that's you know, and, and, yeah. and I really, I'm curious because mm. David and I do also do intergenerational film work mm. where we pair elders with youth in like very cute, wholesome context. Um, where there's like mm. intergenerational learning yeah. and then there's an, you know, it's acknowledging the erasure of history for a lot of like queer elders, for example, right that's on. an example, yeah. right? Um, but I'm particularly curious um, in terms of how you've observed social justice activism, broadly speaking, how has it evolved generationally? Oh man, yeah. Um... Because the nineties was a well time. And I was like not, <laughs> yeah form like I'm not I was not an adult enough to, to yeah. fully grasp oh I neither was I I was a kid I, was I kid. mean even yeah because I'm even just now going down memory lane but like man it, the 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 cancel culture honestly yeah. I would be I would have been canceled with all of the no shit right as a baby mm -hmm. as a baby as a baby okay. fem feminist and all right, all right, let's start there David yeah. let's start there because like the <laughs> question Jen asked is so it's so multidimensional. I would. It's hard to identify where I want to start because, like, I have like right away. I have ten different ways of answering it. But oh, let's wow. start with let's start with the cancel culture piece, right? Yeah. Um, and with what you just said about yourself, right? Like, shit, I would have been canceled. Like, no shit. Like, probably most yeah. of us would have been in different ways, right? Yeah. Um, like you and I might have been canceled in very different ways, or shit, we might have been canceled in really similar ways. Who fucking knows? Yeah. Right? <laughs> but but I'll say this about the about about that period of the nineties, which you know, it's shit. I'm. I'm Full transparency. I'm 47 years old. I'm gonna be 48 soon. Um, I can't believe I'm that old. In my mind, I'm in my mind, I'm 19. I tell, yep. I tell, I tell, <laughs> you know, my kids go to the same high school now. My daughter just started just started high school. My son's a senior mm -hmm. in the high school. And um, you know, I'm I'm pretty involved in like their events and their sports and stuff like that. And so mm -hmm. I always tell them like, yeah, I'm pretty much like the number one ranked dad at La Sierra High School in Riverside, which is like <laughs> completely my own invention. Mm -hmm. But like I, you know, I truly believe it when I'm there at the baseball games, right? Like yeah. I truly believe it when my son was playing freshman basketball and I was yelling at referees. Like I actually believe that shit, right? So in my yeah. in my head, I'm like I'm like very much an immature 19 year old and I act like it. Um, but but I think about that period of the 1990s, and and you know the first thing that comes to mind most of the time is how so many of my classmates, my colleagues, fellow activists, and teachers. Were, grace, were, were graceful with me and patient mm. with me in yeah. ways that in ways that I, I possibly did not deserve, mm -hmm. yeah. okay? Because I was an asshole, mm -hmm. yeah. you know what I mean? Because because like you know I was I was my, my, my shit was 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 patriarchal. My shit was yeah. heteronormative. Yeah. My shit was you know just fucked up in so many different ways. But like they saw in me something about a kind of militant commitment to you know to to world altering movement right like something i they knew i wanted to fight they knew i and, and so it's like at some level all these different people who I, I i it would take me an hour to name even like a tenth of them okay mm -hmm. um yeah. but these folks just just like were graceful and patient and generous enough with me to like not tolerate it but to but to but to firmly critically challenge me on yeah. my shit yeah right and to this day it's the same thing all right, to mm -hmm. this day, right, to this day, yeah. like the people that I'm around are not people who are yes people. They're people who will, who will challenge my shit and say, hey, have you rethought this? Yeah. Um, it's along every possible uh, kind of kind of field of political struggle you can imagine, right? It's race, it's coloniality, it's gender, sexuality, it's everything. Like I'm around, yeah. that's, that's how I live and that's what gives me a sense of being, is being yeah. around people who like will, will do this for each other, right? And, and I try to do it back in whatever way I can. So for me, Part of what what that period of time is defined by is that grace, right? A mm. kind of radical but principled grace, right? Mm. It did not tolerate my shit, but it did challenge it in a really loving, patient, comradely way, right? And mm. this many been many people did this for me and with me. Um, what concerns me about a certain turn that the culture of radical accountability is taken is what you're naming as this cancel culture thing, which I think it's number one, it's it's a reaction, right? It's a reaction. I, I hope that it will just kind of go away in a certain kind of sense that um, folks will understand that, that the, the, the kind of notion of canceling people does not actually, uh, it tends to not actually address the violence. Right. 
right? It might bring some momentary relief because you get that fucker mm -hmm. out of your life mm -hmm. for a second. But like, but but in terms of addressing, much less repairing the the, the violence that's happening, it's that's probably not the way yeah. to make things happen. So I think that's that's part of what concerns me is, and by the way, of course, as we probably would agree on, I think the whole cancel culture piece is endemic, um, or I should say, is organic uh, to the rise of social media. Yep. You know, yeah. kind of like yeah. the public way of of just saying, well, this person did this, they're out. Right. Yeah, it, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, it's one hundred percent tied. It's it's a link to the that the kind of hyper visibility of like an accelerated digital presence. Yeah. That on one hand we have it's it's amazing that everyone gets to have a voice and put themselves out there. On the other hand, everybody has a voice and put themselves yeah, out there. Yeah, so it's not supposed to need to shut the fuck up. Mm -hmm. The only <laughs> thing, up. the only yeah. positive yeah. thing I would say in the like the virtual is is looking at the the through a critical disability lens where um, there is so much more discourse around like neurodiversity and like, you know, having a critical yeah. understanding of like accommodating and accessibility. Yeah. Um, but, 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 you know, I think like, it's interesting with the cancel culture has how that's evolved because I think when David and I started Love Intersections seven yeah. years ago, it was just pre 2016, it was around time for those reasons that you just described mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. yeah. i think yeah exactly it was a response to um but it was like a few years had been around call out culture it was called and yeah. then we were working yeah. with like calling in versus calling out yeah. and now that's so like simplistic <laughs> Wait, you know I, i'm curious though and this uh, it came up in our pre-interview that it's interesting, like, I mean, I don't watch a lot of American news, but I remember seeing a clip of like Fox News talking about canceling cancel culture. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm curious, so I'm, 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 I have, I guess my question is like, and Jen and I were sort of discussing like, you know, as this language gets co-opted by the right, um, what are, how do we respond to that? Do we reclaim that language? Um, do we find new strategies? Do we find new language? Cause it's so interesting, it's similar. I would, I would hate to say a lot of the stuff that we've just talked about with the, with the problems with cancel culture, I've heard also for, on Fox News. <laughs> yeah, here's the thing is that, is that what, what folks need to understand is that you have, you have the power to reject the premise Mm. Right, I was just having this conversation with a teenager the other night, right? Because we were talking mm -hmm. about, I forgot what, what exactly, what issue we were talking about. Mm -hmm. But they were about to try to compare what I do and think and write and teach every day with um, basically what a troll does, right? They're like, isn't it? The, and they weren't being right. mean-spirited, ah. but they were saying like, isn't it the same thing? Aren't you just expressing your opinion the way they're expressing their opinion, right? Huh. Yeah. And so and so I broke that down. I was like, nah, the difference is that not all opinions mean the same fucking mm -hmm. thing. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And so like and so like in what I do, the shit that I do is not merely an opinion. Right. Right. Like I can back my shit up. That mm -hmm. fucker cannot back their shit up other than just to put a meme out there that's catchy. Yeah. Right. And then right. it brings. So 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 part of this is to understand that, yeah, whatever rhetorics folks are attached to, like they're available for expropriation and deforming all the time. That's happening right now with abolition, by the way. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There, there, right. There's, yeah. Pe there's people I know who for actually multiple decades would completely reject affinity and affiliation with abolitionist anything who post 2020 the summer um, have suddenly started calling themselves abolitionists. Some have even gone on, right. you know, put it, put it in their Twitter profile. They call themselves, literally will call themselves abolitionist in the Twitter profile wow. yeah. right? with no connection to any abolitionist collective. No, you know, and also actually a history of rejecting it or maybe, or even being actively hostile to it. Right. right. So like, we just need to understand that we need to understand right. like that's, that's kind of the nature of any discourse is that, is that folks will seize on there's opportunism and there's also just um, kind of fucked up deforming of what mm -hmm. these concepts mean. So, yeah. Given that, you know, it's the wrong question to ask whether a particular term or discourse mm -hmm. needs to be saved from mm -hmm. being seized by liberals or, for that matter, the right, meaning Fox mm -hmm. News, et cetera, and all their friends. Um, mm -hmm. um, the question is the premise, right? Mm -hmm. Can we identify what the premise is, right? And by, by premise, I mean what principles are people working from, what assumptions are they working from, what connections mm -hmm. to 
collectives, right. communities, organizations, movements are they speaking from? That's what I mean by premise, right? Not right. just a kind of right, conceptual right. Ideolo ideological premise. I mean like a grounded premise. What is the grounded premise that people are working from? If they're not working from shit, then you name it, right? Then you can name it. You can name it and say like, I actually mm -hmm. reject your premise. Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. right. And, 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 and that, and that's what, that's what shifts the game a little bit. And then, and then, you mm -hmm. know, maybe, maybe you don't stay wedded to, you don't stay, you know, kind of loyal to that particular rhetoric or that particular term, you know, maybe right. it's time to, to shift it to something. Right. I've been saying that about this term mass incarceration for many years, mm. a term I've never, I, I don't think I've ever used it. Um, but mm. I'm deeply critical of it. At first I was suspicious mm. of it. Then I became deeply critical of it. Once I saw how the term mass incarceration was being mobilized by think tanks, by academia and academics, um, by you know wow. nonprofits and so forth, and I was yeah. like, this is actually this weird uh, deforming and expropriation of yeah. of the of the movement against the prison against the prison industrial yeah. complex that turned into an abolitionist movement, and they turned it into this thing called mass incarceration, yeah. which right. tends to kind of rest on a certain liberal universal humanism mm -hmm. that thinks mm -hmm. about the mass. It's like it's not the mass mm -hmm. people. This is like right. asymmetrical targeted warfare against specific populations, black people in particular, mm -hmm. um, and then other populations in certain geographies, right? So that's what it, it's actually war. It's not mass incarceration. Yeah. It's actually targeted warfare. It's asymmetrical warfare. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying like that's what I mean about about these words and terms is like yeah. We shouldn't, and also let's take some fucking joy in doing that, right? Like take the yeah. terms that people are attached to and break that shit down. It's fucking fun, mm -hmm. yeah. right? And mm -hmm. it's cool because people get into it like, oh shit, you know, I never thought about it that way. And like, they might still stay attached to it, but like now they got to think about it differently. Um, I mean, that's why I asked the generation question because it's yeah. like words come around mm -hmm. and then it's like, it's, 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 it, every generation has like this different approach and strategy to different words whether mm -hmm. they're attached to it or not. And then it all comes back around in like micro trends as well. Yeah. 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 Fascinating. Yeah. 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 So, so, so the question for me is, 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 is it le has less, much less to do with the particular concepts, words, and terms that particular generations use. Mm -hmm. the, the question I think, I think all of us across generations have to constantly bring to the table is, is how are we weaponizing these terms in the service of liberation right. struggle? Mm -hmm. Okay, like, and I'm and I use the term, the verb weaponizing, very consciously and yeah. very deliberately and in a yeah. principled way, right? Because mm -hmm. um, the point is to to disrupt what is, right? Because mm -hmm. what is is so full of atrocity and and horror and misery for mm -hmm. for for so many targeted people, right? That it must be abolished, like it has to stop. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've been part of multiple collectives struggling around police violence, in particular police killing. Mm -hmm. And what gets me, and I'll say this for the rest of my life, every time I'm involved with any collective that does that kind of work, right? I, I'm I, I think that the primary principle and agenda point of every collective that is struggling around police, a, a particularly police killing, should be this. It should be, okay, our collective is committed to the principle and the agenda point of no more police killings. Mm. not one more, mm -hmm. right? Mm. And fuck you if you oppose that, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. we will not tolerate a, that is the goal. The goal is not one more. It's yeah. not police reform. It's not diversity training. It's not getting more um, so-called transparency. And it's not getting a police, a cop prosecuted who is part of this thing. It's like, that's, that's, that's all we're, we're going to put that to the side because that stuff, that stuff is, is kind of, kind of a, a liberal project. Right. Those mm -hmm. are liberal. Those are kind of liberal projects that allow mm -hmm. the police to stay intact while individualizing the problems. Mm -hmm. If we think about something like fatal, targeted, anti-black, colonial, racist police violence as a thing. Right. If we identify it as a thing, then the principle to me and to like pretty much every abolitionist I know is for it to stop right now. Mm -hmm. For there to be not one more. We don't tolerate it and we don't condone it to stop right now. And so. If we if we operate from that, you know, I was using the word premise earlier. If if we're mm -hmm. operating from that premise across generations and within generations, right? Whatever generations are, and whatever however we identify and define generations, um, if we if we're working from a premises like that, I think what it does is it changes our relationship to the terms that we organize around, mm. right? Because now because now it's it, it's less about fetishizing a particular term is more like, okay, we're going to, we're going to work with this concept and this rhetoric, or maybe even this story and this narrative. Mm -hmm. right? Sometimes mm -hmm. it's not a term. Sometimes it's a narrative. Sometimes it's somebody's story. 
and, and, and we need to put this, we need to weaponize and mobilize this narrative or this term. Um, that's what I mean by weaponizing, right? It's like, it's part, it actually becomes part of, 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 of insurgency yeah. against what is. Hmm. I'm curious if you um, about organizing. <laughs> have you seen what sort of um, if in your community? What sort of the have you seen some really cool coalition building or methods? Oh hell um, yeah! Like, oh yeah. man, yeah. I've been I've been I've been like humbly taught by so many people in recent times about forms of organizing. Um, off the top of my head, I'm thinking about the Strike MoMA folks in New York. Oh, like yeah. If, if y'all are not familiar, like go look them up, look up Strike MoMA. Yeah. Just unbelievable. I got, again, like folks who are generous to a, probably to a fault. I haven't seen yeah. the faults yet, but they're generous as hell. They invited me in. Like I, I, I was, and I told them like, look, I'm a guest in your movement. Like I just want to say and do whatever I can to keep this moving along. So, but like, but just the enthusiasm that people had to, to, and Stri what Strike Moma is doing, it, it, it's a movement against the museum, against the kind of philanthropic, owning yeah. class, blue blood, colonial, anti-black um, uh, 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 administrative ownership, corporate ownership, basically, of, of, that, of that elite art world in, mm -hmm. in, in the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. And, they, and what Strike Moma has done is a collective of artists um, led by, you know, queer artists, Palestinian artists, black artists, etc., who have identified this particular institution and site as a primary expression of anti-black and colonial violence and power yeah. like and we're talking hemispherically and in terms of yeah. the whole last half millennium like and i'm like mm. holy shit that just blew my mind that is right on yeah. right the way that the way that these folks have like colonized the art world is absolutely a primary primary expression in in, yep. in like structure so that that's one group right and the shit they're doing is is just is just unbelievable it's my, i can't even describe it's hard to even describe OK, what yeah. they're doing. The, the other example I'll give you is the stuff around mutual aid. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, and it's a term I'll provisionally use because people different people use different terms. Yes. Okay? Yes. But but I think about um, like, for example, I'll give you the example that I draw on all the time. Um, Amika Tendahi, who's one of the co-founders and Martin Cabral, who's the other co-founder co of, of an organization called Ujima Medics in Chicago. Um, if it, Hey, if you all don't mind, I'd love it if you would put their link in the description of our discussion, because we'll um, they, they 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 only thrive off grassroots help. Right? What was their um, name again? Ujima Medics. U J I M A A. Ujima Medics. They, you'll see them. That, like Vice did a special on them. Like they, folks in Chicago know who they are. Mm -hmm. um, but 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 Amika refers to she, Amika doesn't use the term mutual aid. Amika uses the term um, um, deep deep responsibility, deep mm. shared responsibility, mm. right? And she has a whole kind of conversation and theorization of this term responsibility which says it's so much um more than mutual aid like she doesn't like the term mutual aid so she'll say yeah. responsibility on the other hand dean spade yeah um who has that great site you know um um that 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 kind of is a great resource for people that need to find access or, or want to participate in mutual aid organizing you know dean works with the mutual aid paradigm so so Across that spectrum of folks that are doing the, the work from what Ujima Medics calls shared responsibility to what Dean Spade calls mutual aid. Like the stuff I've learned from that crowd of organizing yeah. has been completely life altering for me. Right. And, mm -hmm. and the thing that stands out is something Dean said to me more than a year ago, which was um, one of the implicit and sometimes unidentified problems in, in different movements, particularly ones that are tied to the nonprofit industrial complex. Is a tendency to want to centralize and create big organizations. Yeah. Right. right? A yeah. kind of a kind of a kind of notion. It's almost like a monopoly capitalist kind of tendency, right? Yeah. It's like yeah. you have all this different shit happening all over all over the yeah. hemisphere. And then let's create one giant organization, one hashtag, and like we'll all be under that one giant umbrella. And and, and what Dean said in this conversation, and it was part of this thing um that 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 I worked with when I was president of the American Studies Association last year. It was called the Freedom Courses, right? And it's like a YouTube channel. It's free. You'll hear oh. Dean talk about this. Um, you all can put that link up too. I'll give it to you later. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But we had this whole discussion on mutual aid. And you'll hear Dean talk about it in this, in this Freedom Course, where he said, you know, creating a central national giant organization is actually, in most cases, it's contrary to what we should be doing. Right. Right? What he said is that what we need to be doing is proliferating as many, mm -hmm. you know, um, as many differently scaled, yeah. locally situated organi organizations and mobilizations and collectives as possible. 
Yeah. Right. And, and in my view, the reason that resonates with me so much is that in my view, what that is, is a kind of, it's a particular rearticulation of a guerrilla warfare strategy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Cause yeah. like now you don't have like one central organization that can be yeah. taken down. Shit, yeah. man, like you see some of the vulnerabilities happening right now with the Black Lives Matter Global Foundation, right? right? All the critiques coming up around that. And it's like, that shit is contrary to what the spirit of the movement for Black Lives really was when, you know, it really started to blossom um, in response to the killing of Michael Brown and Ferguson right. and so forth, right? So like the, the sense of proliferation is one of the other kind of organizing strategies and paradigms for that matter, that's really uh, gotten, um, I think, traction with me and other people in recent times. It's like, no, we don't need to have a fucking corporate yeah. center to all this yeah. shit. We need to be proliferating it in large and small ways. And what organizing looks like is going to be different all the time. And it should be different all the time, right? Because artists don't mm -hmm. organize the same, collectives of artists don't organize the same way yeah. that, yeah. you know, collectives of independent scholars and academics organize. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like they don't organize the same way that, that, that like student militants that are coming from a revolutionary, revolutionary nationalist or anti-colonial perspective organize. So like the proliferation yeah. sense is also one of the big things. Mm -hmm. Just two yeah. examples. I mean, this is this is a conversation that Dave and I have often around the concept of growth when we're, yeah. you know, doing strategic planning on about love intersections and how mm. and where we want to evolve and how, and how we want to grow, um, because we have long resisted growing bigger. Um, yeah. So we're we're look you know we're like diversifying and hacking the system through like grants and mm -hmm. all, all the different ways that we hack the system. Um, David, feel free to jump in. Yeah. Um, well, it just also I mean? reminds me. I um I, I worked for a theater company called Theater for Living. We did um it's an evolution of theater of the oppressed. It's a different type. Right on. But yeah, yeah. David Dave, David Diamond said to me in my job interview, <laughs> he said it's it's against the laws of nature for things to last forever because I asked yeah. him what was his what was his yeah. succession plan yeah. was and so theater for living recently after he retired he closed the company to keep that keep that um you know yes open up funding for other emerging theater companies but also you know taking up that space in in a certain ecology also has an impact as well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. and we've really resisted being the we often are the David and I get called to do anything that has anything related to gay, queer, and Asian. Yeah, yeah. In Vancouver, <laughs> of course, of course, of course, yeah. for that very reason. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, this is this is so. so what I, what I think you're helping me clarify. But I fucking appreciate you all so much. This is such a good conversation, and like, it's just weird to me that it's going to be on YouTube forever. But I just I'm like. <laughs> it, it, it's making my it's making my it's clearing clearing my head in so many important ways and i wish we could go another three hours um um so thank you again for inviting me but what you're helping me clarify is that part of the work you're doing is, and the reason i love your show and i'm subscribed to and all that stuff oh. is, is is that is that it does the work it does the activist work of exemplifying right like what what if, what if we what if we just kind of focus on that Mm. Right. Like, mm -hmm. like not growth. Right. Like not getting larger grants and sh hey, Tammy, Ho, what's up? <laughs> That's my colleague and longtime friend. Teaches oh, awesome. Years. Hey, Tammy. Um, uh, what, what, what if we focus on, on, on that as a, a kind of primary and radical form of, of organizing strategies just to exemplify. Mm -hmm. right. right. It could be like a small, sustained group of folks who just exemplify Mm. a way of doing things and also not just a way of doing things but a way of being in the world that i really appreciate you all doing here mm. like i'm deeply touched by it right like a way of being in the world that mm. is is like it's way too fucking rare for people that are trying to do you know radical and abolitionist and and, and, and feminist and queer work it's like it's like a way of being the, the work of exemplifying is fucking hard too though it's joyful you know what I mean? It's fucking, we laugh and but it's i know it's tiring i know i mean y'all been sustaining this i didn't realize it's been that long <laughs> right. But like the work of exemplifying, like that shit goes a, such a long way um, because mm -hmm. it lets other people know. It's like, yeah, no, you pick this up, pick this up where you're at. Right. Like pick this up with your collective, do it your way um, and be robust and be promiscuous about it. Like, like do it, do it in all kinds of other ways and be experimental. And also don't be afraid to shut that shit down when it's all fucked mm -hmm. up and it fails. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that's, 
Yeah. Oh, I'm stealing yeah. this. I'm going to steal yeah. this. Be promiscuous about it, David. That's another way of saying what Dean Spade was teaching me a year ago, which is like proliferate. Yeah. Right. Proliferate. Like that. Hey, yo, that is what that is what kind of like the right wing. And for that matter, many liberals are scared shitless about. Mm -hmm. They're scared about like radical abolitionist, revolutionary, liberationist people proliferating their shit. They want us to right. consolidate stuff into one organization that they can yeah. then fucking target and haze and torture and fucking troll and destroy. They want that. What right. they what what nobody can handle is if it is proliferated, if it, if it turns into like in a you know a, a 21st century version of guerrilla struggle. Yeah. Um you know with all of its experimentation, all of its dynamic movement and so forth. That's that's what I that's what I that's what I want to see in my lifetime, right? Like, like, I, you know, I, I want to see that. victory. I want to see like mm -hmm. liberated world in my lifetime, which I don't know I'm yeah. ready to live in. By the way, <laughs> 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 like I might need to leave. Like I might need to be put into a very narrow role in a liberated yeah. world. I'm not a liberated person. I try so hard to fight, right? And I'm not sure yeah. that I'm like ready. But you know, so I want to see it in my lifetime. But I'm also, you know, mm -hmm. I understand how history works. It's like my the, the 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 privilege and honor I have is to be work to be part of this work with you all, right? Mm -hmm. To contribute to this long historical script of struggle, like that's mm -hmm. that's what we should be, um, kind of kind of um, uh, taking joy and pleasure in, mm -hmm. in, in, in kind of collectively thriving in is like we are privileged to be part of that script, mm -hmm. that yes. long historical script. Yeah. One of uh, the thing that helps me the most and in really helps my sanity is that I am consistently surprised by people, um, meeting people, finding out they're like interlopers and like undercover in spaces and places. And it has really helped to, yeah, I, it's just, it's just been really, really amazing to, to experience yeah. that, I think. How did it become 601? I don't know. I'm I'm at a loss for words. Um, we, have, we should we have to ask you the the question we, we do ask have all to of ask our guests you. though. Yes. Yeah. Which is what's what's your favorite hot pot ingredient? Actually, no, we've adjusted it. What's your favorite hot pot ingredient or experience? Scallops. 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 No one has ever said scallops before. No one's ever said okay, scallops. so so like I'm saying it partly because I'm I was pretty sure no one had ever said that. <laughs> <laughs> so there's like a vanity to be in the, but, but it's also because it's also it's also fucking true. Yeah. It's also true. Like yeah, like in, in 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 my family and most of my loved ones and friends, like if there's a hot pot and there's scallops, there's gonna be like either an explicit struggle around who's gonna get them. <laughs> Yeah. Or like a low key passive aggressive struggle over who's going to get them. Right. If there's right. a certain brother in law involved, then <laughs> what it's going to be is like is like my significant other will be like hoarding them and saying you better eat them before that fucker does. <laughs> oh, this is on like live stream, isn't it? Um, yeah. Anyway, anyway, scallops all day and all night in the hot pot. Like if you Amazing. gave me a hot pot with just scallops in it, like I. <laughs> I would think that I was in the afterlife already. Like, I, don't even know I, I don't even know that I believe in the afterlife, but if you give me a hot pot with just scallops, maybe some noodles, like oh, some yeah. scallops and noodles and shit, maybe some spice in it, like I'm good. And you might have me believe in the afterlife that is already <laughs> Amazing. I'm sure they're in an alternate universe. There is a man. world just of scallops. Of hey, it's, good, scallops. it's good to dream, man. It's good to dream. It's good to dream. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dylan, for joining us. You're so today. generous for having me on. Like, I, I know I probably made no sense during this one hour, <laughs> no. but like, I just, I'll tell you though, regardless of that, I enjoyed myself so much. I don't take anything back. Um, apologies out there if I curse too much, but kind of not really. <laughs> I kind of, kind of don't. I kind of don't apologize. Um, hey, I didn't cry and I didn't start yelling at you, so that's a victory. <laughs> that's great. You know, it's always a good sign. You know what I mean? No, but like, I just, I just appreciate the sense of love and generosity that you all express. And again, use that word exemplify. You all exemplify all the time on, on, on the show. So thank you. Thank oh, you for thank having me. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Dylan. Thank <laughs> you. Well, we don't have a guest to introduce for next week uh, on the 18th, same time, same place. It's going to be David's it's my birthday, birthday. <laughs> <laughs> and we're having a th our finale episode. Our that's finale just finale episode. Just Jen and I. So. And uh, we'll be, yes, we'll be sharing our experience with the whole season. Uh, we'll talk about some funny moments, some moments we cried, I'm sure. 
some moments where okay. I almost passed away because I was so ill from the vaccine shot, you know, that oh sort of God. thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank Great. you, everyone. Great. Have a good night. <laughs> Bye.